If you have your Bibles this morning, go ahead and open them up to the book of Matthew in the sixth chapter, starting in the 25th verse. I have a confession for you this morning. I, I am what would qualify currently as a textbook overthinker. Anybody, anybody else overthinkers? Just me? That's going to make this so much worse. I am a textbook overthinker, which counter to how the kind of wording kind of seems, it, it doesn't mean that I think too much. I think most of us could probably afford to think more. And it's not that I'm overprepared or I, I, I over plan for things or, or anything else like that. Just yesterday, I went on a run because the weather was great and I forgot that the sun was out for the first time in like three months. And I wore a shirt that had no sleeves and now my arms are as red as Rudolph's nose. And I'm suffering the consequences for my lack of thinking. That's not what we're talking about. Whenever, whenever I say overthinking, I think we know and we understand that that's the kind of current vernacular to explain and describe a, a propensity to worry or be anxious about things. A propensity to worry or be anxious about things. I overthink nearly every interpersonal interaction I have ever had in my life. And if you're thinking, have I overthought an interaction that I've had with you? The answer is yes. Almost all of them. I will get in the car, I'll get in my office or something, and I'll think, did I say too much? Did I not say enough? Did I say the wrong thing? Did I say the right thing too harshly? Did I not say the right thing harshly enough? Was I smiling too much? Did it come off weird? Was I not smiling enough and someone thinks that I'm mean? I'm like 6'2", 300 pounds, so I always feel the need to be like overly bubbly or else I come across as this like angry monster. I'm overthinking, I'm overthinking this moment right now. I was overthinking this sermon at like 4.30 in the morning. Whenever I go home, I will overthink it. I will walk down these steps, ask pastor how it was. He'll say something encouraging. I won't believe it and I'll go home and I'll take a nap and then things will be better. That is what I do. And my, my hope is that you do to some degree a version of the same thing. And statistically, you do at least if any of the surveys are to be believed. I am constantly worrying or anxious about something. But very rarely do I have a time where I feel like nothing is weighing on me. Now, those times are, are sweet and valued, but they are, at least in my experience, rare. If you would have asked me in high school or in college if I struggled with anxiety or worried, I, I probably would have quickly said, no. But as I've gotten older and as I've, I've really gotten more self-aware and reflective of what we're actually talking about here, I, I've realized that, that I am very, very prone to struggle in this particular area. And this morning, as we've been walking through the things the last couple of weeks that Jesus does in preparing the way for the cross and ultimately for the resurrection, we come to one of the most vital things that he does and that he deals with. In this text in particular, but overarching in the Christian life, and that is what he speaks into worry and anxiety. So in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 25, hear what Christ says. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you more worthy than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God's clothes, the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all of these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. The, the first 
thing to observe and to see from this text that, that Jesus is communicating. W- worrying and anxiety was, is, and will be a real problem. Now, the context of this is set on the heels of the, in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's just mentioned how you can't love both God and money. You're going to hate one and love the other. And out of that, he says, therefore, do not worry about your life or what you're going to eat or drink or about your clothing, what, what things can buy. He says, you can't serve God and money. Therefore, don't worry about what you're going to potentially buy or what you have to have to live. He says the Gentiles worry about these things. Now, what's the context there? He's, he's saying that those that are not the people of God, those who do not follow and worship God, they seek after those things. And he tells us, do not worry about it. Now, here's the reality when it comes to worry and anxiety. It, it is a emotional response of dread or concern, or you can add all kinds of adjectives to it. But the, the point is, It is an emotion. And that's a big deal because we need to acknowledge the fact that whenever we are worrying or anxious in those immediate moments, we're not making a choice to be anxious or to worry. If you've ever experienced worry about something or if you get a phone call or you get a piece of news or something pops into your head and your immediate response is to worry or to be anxious, that's an emotional response. You're not thinking, hmm, I could either not worry about this or I could worry about it. And I think what I'm going to do, because I love it so much, is I'm gonna choose to worry about it. That's not what we do. It's an emotional response. And Jesus here is telling us to stop. Now, just to kind of test the waters here, has anyone ever told you whenever you're experiencing an emotion to stop? Has anyone ever told you to calm down? Has anyone ever told you to stop being whatever that is? If you're angry, hey, stop being angry. Okay, that works every single time, right? (laughs) If you're experiencing an emotion and somebody tells you, hey, that emotion you're having, cut that out. You're like, oh, gosh, yeah, I can't believe I was doing that. I was being so silly. Thanks for telling me that. That snapped me out of it. That has never worked. So it's interesting that Jesus comes into this emotional space of of worry and anxiety and he tells us, don't do that. But how Jesus is going to do this should set a little bit of the temple of how we should respond in other situations. But ultimately, he's not going to come in and just say, stop that. He's going to tell us, don't do that. What? Worry, be anxious. He's going to give us the reason why we shouldn't And then he's going to tell us what we should do instead. So we experience worry or anxiety and and Christ is coming in and saying, hey, don't do that. But he's not just going to leave it there, which is where I have often made the mistake. He's going to say, don't do that because do this instead. So that's the kind of logic and argument that Jesus is going to make here. An estimated 31% of the U.S. population will experience what would be classified as an anxiety disorder of some kind at some point in their life. In the most recent survey, 49.4% of Arkansans say they have extreme worry or anxiety about something at least once a week. It is a real and present problem. It's a real issue. And I think all of us know that. And it's talking here specifically about concern for the things that we need, but the principle extends to all of life and all of anxiety and all of worry. And the latest scientific research actually shows something that the Bible has made clear all throughout its testimony, which is an over dwelling on your difficulties. Because sometimes we can think, well, what's the harm in being anxious or, or worrying? What's the, what's the potential error of that? One of those, even just evidentially, is that the more that you dwell on the troubles and problems in your life or the potential troubles and problems in your life, they don't shrink. It causes them to grow. 
becomes expanded. It becomes bigger. That's why in Philippians 4, Paul doesn't tell us whatever is troubling, whatever is worrisome, whatever makes you anxious, whatever could potentially go wrong, whatever is an error, whatever is a conflict, dwell on that. No, he says whatever is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable and excellent, anything worthy of praise, think on those things. So we want to be removed from anxiety and worry for the things that he's going to show us and because it's not good for us. Anxiety, worrying, is borrowing tomorrow's trouble for today. It is borrowing tomorrow's trouble for the day. It is dwelling on the trouble of what could be at the expense of experiencing the good of what is. It is the dwelling on the trouble of what could be at the expense of experiencing the good of what is. Even in my silly examples, and I, and I, and I joke, but it's also 100% true, I overthink almost every interaction that I have. That's not a good quality. That's not a good character trait. Because what I'll do is I'll go home or I'll sit in my car and I'll think and I'll, I, will, I will go to, and I can, if I don't stop it quickly and I'll follow Jesus' command here, I will jump to a conclusion that because of a either awkward, real, or perceived in my mind that you hate me. Or that I've done something terribly wrong. That needs to, and, and it will, what, what, what is a small moment will grow to exponential, existential conflict. And it's not true. It's not reality. But it's where I let my brain potentially get. It's not even a real problem. I'm worrying about something that's not even real. And in the midst of doing that, I'm missing out on the good that is in the very moment that I'm in. That is not a good way to walk through life. And it's one of the first things that Jesus says whenever he tells us to, to stop worrying. He gives an example, and that example is that who has added even one moment to their life by worrying or being anxious? Friend, worry and anxiety has never once helped you. Worry and anxiety has never once helped you. You have never been benefited by stewing on the problems in your life or the could-be problems in your life, or allowing yourself to roll into a session of just being anxious or, or worrying or overthinking about a multitude of things. Who are you or who among you has added one moment to your life by worrying? Jesus is saying it's doing you no good. It's not helping. It's not working. It's got no Upside, And when Jesus tells us not to worry, he roots that command in a logic and a reason. What is it? He says, don't worry. Essentially, it's not good for you. Who, is, who of you have, have benefited at all from doing this? And then he gives his reason of why you shouldn't worry. And he, and he roots all of this in creation. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't do those things, and God takes care of them. Look at the grass of the field doesn't do that. God takes care of them. And how much more worthy or of worth are you than all of these? You are so much more valuable than a bird. You are so much more valuable than the grass or the trees or, or anything that we see in creation. He's saying if the father looks after this of his creation in this way, then what on earth makes you think that he's not going to do the same for you? If he looks after the sparrow, then why would he ignore you? He's saying God cares and knows and will supply our every need. He knows, he cares, and he will supply our every single need need. So he tells us, don't worry. He makes this case as to why. It's not helping you. And God is going to care. D don't worry about how you're going to care for yourself. God will care for you. Don't stress out about what you can't afford or the things that you might not be able to get or the issues that, that might come up or might be happening or the tomorrow's trouble. So God will care for you and provide for you what you need. And then after telling us what 
not to do and why not to do it, he then moves us from just removing ourselves from a certain emotion because of a reality and he presses us towards an action. And that action is instead of worrying, seek the kingdom of God. Christ's logic and reason and argument here is very, very clear. He's saying, don't worry, don't stress, don't be anxious. Why? It's not good for you and God is going to take care of you. And instead of doing all of that and wasting your time with that, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Just in the book of Matthew, Jesus mentions the kingdom of God some 50 times. That's 1.5 times per page in most Bibles. He speaks of the kingdom of God about 126 times throughout the Gospels with another 50 some odd mentions throughout the rest of the epistles and histories of the New Testament. It could easily be argued that the whole thesis of Jesus' teaching ministry was this idea and concept and reality of the kingdom of God. When he rose, we are told he spent 40 days on earth doing what? Teaching about the kingdom of God. It's all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. It's in the Lord's Prayer. It is arguably the major theme of the life and ministry of Christ. But what is it? Jesus mentions it all that time. It's mentioned all that time in the rest of the New Testament. And it's interesting because it's one of the only major ideas and themes in all of the biblical text that is never defined. You never get the part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, or or John the Baptist even says, the kingdom of God is at hand or the kingdom of heaven is near or any of these things. And he says, well, and by that, here's what I mean. We don't get that. And so not just books, but like literal tomes have been written by theologians about what the kingdom of God is. There are numerous sermons and articles. And I mean, you could spend, we could spend all year on that idea, but we're not gonna do that even though I would really like to. We're not gonna do that. I I think for us, the the most clear, concise, probably helpful definition um, comes from Matt Chandler. And though not perfect, his threefold definition is probably going to be the most helpful. Because it's important to understand what the kingdom of God is because he roots all of our action and our removal of worry from that. Don't worry, it's not good for you. God will care for you, but instead do this. And if we're going to do this, we need to know what this is. And so if we were going to define the kingdom of God, how would we define it? I think it's helpful to define it like this. Three Ds. One, first, God's dwelling. The kingdom of God is God's dwelling. The kingdom of God is where God is. One of the major biblical themes throughout the Old and New Testament is the idea of Emmanuel, God with us. What was so special and unique and good about the Garden of Eden? God was with us in right relationship. Throughout after sin and the expulsion from the garden, what's one of the most influential things that happens in the Old Testament? The idea of the tabernacle and the presence of God being with his people. The Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. God is with his people in that place. What's the significance of the incarnation whenever Christ is born? God with us. Whenever we repent of sin and follow Jesus, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. The most extreme and perfect example of what it means for God to be with us. The kingdom of God is where God is. Dwells And where does God dwell now? In his people, in you. As the Holy Spirit fills you and seals you, his presence is in you by virtue of that indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are heavenly ambassadors and emissaries for the King of kings and Lord of lords because in you dwells the literal presence of God. It's what enables us to bring light to darkness and order to chaos. The presence of God. So to seek the kingdom of God is to seek the presence of God. 
To seek the kingdom of God is to seek the presence of God where he dwells. Next, God's dominion. God's dominion. More than just the relational connection to our king, there is the job that comes along with it. We're not just saved into the family, we're saved into the family business. And there's a business that we are to be about, and it's the exercising of God's dominion, which is most clearly laid out in what are the, considered to be the, the two greats of the Bible. There's, oh, we, we could spend so much time on what all that means and how we exercise God's dominion and look at the garden and look at the Old Testament. We could, we could spend a lot of time doing that. But for our purposes this morning, for New Testament believers, for New Covenant believers, the clearest articulation of what it means to exercise the dominion of God is one, the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you and I'm with you always to the end of the age. Make disciples. And second, the great commandment, love God and love people. All of the law and the prophets hangs on this. So we are saved into God's family. We are indwelt with God's presence. And then we are called to the business of the dominion of the kingdom of God through the making of disciples and loving God and loving people. It's one of the things that Jesus means whenever in the Lord's prayer, he says, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. By seeing disciples multiplied, and by his people loving him and loving others. To seek the kingdom of God is to do the work of God. To seek the kingdom of God is to do the work of God. Last thing in our little definition, God's dynasty. God's dynasty. This is a way that we, we typically don't think of the kingdom or of, of our relationship. We, we use a lot of family language, which is good and helpful and true, but this is a reality as well. I was reminded while, while watching the, the Apple TV's got a new series called Dynasty, which is based off the book by Jeff Benedict on uh, Tom Brady and the Patriots. It's awesome. It is. I was not a huge basketball fan, but I still love the last dance and everything going on with Michael Jordan. This is what I really wanted which is the football equivalent of that. It is the greatest football dynasty in the history of ever. Patrick Mahomes fans can find me after the service. It's not even debatable. And, and, and it reminds me while I'm watching that, that there, is, there is something special and, and, and even beyond special, there's something aspirational, whether or not you're a sports person or not, about seeing a group of people rallied around a common cause and doing those things with an extreme level of excellence. It's one of the things that, that always probably most clearly reflected the reality of what the church is, can be, should be, is a, a great football team. Now, I played football, so I'm, I'm biased towards believing that. But it's interesting to see people from all different walks of life, from all different backgrounds, from all different, I mean, all different everything, come into a room and let the main thing be the main thing and push towards that goal. Scoring touchdowns, winning Super Bowls, winning games, all that fun stuff. And as I was watching that, I was reminded of just how fun that can be. To be in a room with a group of people, all different in so many different ways, but rallied around that one thing. The dynasty of God is a different way about thinking of the family of God, but it's still just as accurate. We are called and told that we will be co-heirs with Christ, that we are going to be in the function of reigning and ruling forever alongside Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. We are in the line of a royal priesthood of believers that are all working towards the goal of our King. And friend, it's hard to worry when you're with a people with a purpose. It's not impossible, but it's way harder 
when you're with a people with a purpose. To seek the kingdom of God is to be with the people of God. So putting it all together, this is not perfect. There's a whole lot of different ways that you could define this. But for us this morning, seeking the kingdom of God is seeking God's presence in community with the people of God, participating in the work of God. Seeking the kingdom of God is seeking God's presence in the community with the people of God, participating in the work of God. So what does he mean when he says this? I I think he means this. When we seek his kingdom and his righteousness, what are we told? All these things will be provided for you. You will have what you need. As you seek God and the community of his people towards the ends that he has given us to accomplish, you will have what you need. Now, that is very, very different than saying you will have what you want. I think we get that. But more than that, it, it is very, very different than saying that you will have what you think you need. Because friend, almost never is what I think I need actually what I need. If I had gotten everything that I thought I needed, I would not be here today. I would not be married to my wife. I would not have my son. I would not be here. I probably wouldn't even be in the state. God knows what we need, what we truly need. And most of the time, whenever he's saying, this is what you need, my response, at least in the past, has been a little bit of, that's great and all. But I I think what I really need is this. And it, it's towards what end? When it, whenever we talk about like what we, what we need, it's, it's, it's towards an end or towards a goal. You need this for what? For what? And what was the ultimate purpose in the New Testament? That those that have been saved and called by Christ who have repented of their sin and followed him in faith be made more into the likeness of Christ. It's our sanctification. It's our progressive sanctification. It is ongoing And it is forward moving. And as we are ongoing and forward moving into becoming more like Jesus, we are going to have to go through things that we do not want to go through. We are going to go through things that we would always argue, I don't need to go through this. But God in his sovereignty and his love and in his kindness says, yes, you do. Why? It's going to make you more like Christ. And this is the reality of the worldview of the New Testament. Most of the time, that is going to include some level, sometimes a great level of suffering. Why? Because the person we are being made in the likeness of went to a cross, was called a man of sorrows, sacrificed anything and everything. And so if we are going to be made into the likeness of him, what would ever give us the idea that we were going to be saved from any and all suffering? The process of discipleship is signing on for a life of some measure of suffering. We are told that explicitly by Christ. Because what does he say? If you are to follow me, you are to what? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And remember, this is before the crucifixion and the resurrection and the cross having this image that we have today of of victory and of reconciliation. And we put it on walls in our houses and pictures and all those. This is when the only understanding and context for the cross was a machine and mechanism and method of death and torture. And he's telling people that want to follow him, Jesus, you seem awesome. What do I have to do to follow you? Great. Deny yourself, take up that. And that'll give you some idea about what the life's going to be like. 
What God knows we need is often very different than what we think we need. But we trust him in those moments. And this kingdom is already not yet. We've talked about this before in the past. It's been mentioned. The kingdom of God is here. It is coming and it will come. What we ultimately need is him in perfection and to be made in glory. And that will come, but it's in the process. So we're not to worry because it's not good for us, because God provides for us. Instead, we seek the kingdom of God, his presence, his work, his people. What do we walk away with this morning? What truth do we hold on to? Practically, what do we think of? There's a lot of different ways that we could go, but for our time this morning, I want us to dwell just on one main idea. Jesus assumes something in this teaching that is incredibly powerful and that if we get it into our very bones and if we have it decided in our hearts, it will get us through anything life can bring. And it's a simple truth, but it's a hard truth to walk out in practice. And it's, it's this. Truth has a real effect on our emotions. Truth has a real effect on our emotions. Let's just take Jesus as an example. He speaks very Jesus-like because that's what Jesus does, which means often he's quoting scripture and he's speaking lines that become scripture and sound very scripturally. And the majority of the times, it's truth claims. We don't get a whole of, lot of the, the conversations that he just kind of had on the side with the disciples or with people around. I'm sure those existed, but what we have in the text, the majority of the time are these truth claims. Of course, anything that Jesus says is truth, but he makes a point to teach or say something in high intensity moments that bring truth into confusion and order into chaos, comfort into grief and every other appropriate thing for every other appropriate setting. When Jesus is tempted by the enemy in the desert, what does he do? He tells him the truth. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word of God. When Lazarus dies and grieves, what does he do? He tells the truth. Surely I tell you, he will rise. When he's in the garden praying desperately to the Father, what does he do? He tells the truth. If there's any way for this cup to be passed from me, let it be. But even so, not your will, or not my will, but yours be done. When he's on the cross, what does he do? He tells the truth. Jesus is constantly in these high intensity moments speaking things that are true. It's one of the reasons why scripture memory is so important is because whenever we are experiencing emotions that we don't want to, like worry and anxiety, what should we do? Listen to the truth. Tell ourselves the truth. It's what you need whenever struggles come is truth. No matter how greatly or now it matters greatly, the manner in which that truth is brought. But that's what you need. And you might say that that doesn't work for me. Whenever I'm experiencing something like worry or anxiety or grief or, or, or any variety of, of negative emotions that I don't want to feel and someone tells me the truth, it doesn't do anything for me. Now, removing the potential of people that are unkind in their explanation or giving of the truth. If, if that's you, like it's been me so many times in the past, you say it just doesn't work, there's an important caveat. It works if we are trusting the truth. It works if we are trusting the truth. Now, there is a chasm of difference between knowing the truth and trusting the truth. It's why Jesus here brings the kind of accusation against people that are listening and says, you of little faith. Why are you worrying about these things? God will provide for you. Why? They aren't believing in God's provision. When the truth doesn't connect, it's not because the truth isn't true. It's because we aren't fully trusting it. The reality of the truth doesn't change, but our experience to it 
can influence our ability to rightly see it and rightly relate to it. And that doesn't mean that we go through life just floating in this euphoric sense of serenity for all of our days and that nothing will ever bother us. But it centers us in a special, special way. It's, it's why whenever a strong believer loses a loved one, the peace that passes all understanding that the Bible talks about, where you can be filled with grief, but secure in joy at the same time. Why? Because the truth claims of the text are believed that there is an eternity and that we do not grieve as those without hope. That we are provided that hope. And this is true in every area, but specifically true when it comes to worry and anxiety. We must tell ourselves the truth. And that requires repetition. When anxieties come, remind yourself of the truth and keep telling yourself the truth until you believe it. No matter what you're anxious about, no matter what you're worried about, the thing that you need in those moments is for the reality of the truths of Christ to intersect and impact those moments and areas of worrying and anxiety. Now, all those things are relatively simple, but they're not particularly easy. Anytime we talk about our emotional life, it's not particularly easy, even though some of the things that we know might be simple. And most of the time we walk into some of these things with some level of confusion, or at least I do. And one of the things that I've heard pastors say now for, for many, many years is this. When you don't know what to do, do what you know. When you don't know what to do, do what you know. Life will bring times when you feel lost and clueless and you don't know what to do and you are filled with anxiety and worry about what tomorrow might bring. Do the things that will never change regardless of what the circumstances are. Make disciples. Love God. Love people. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. Show up for your family. Stay in community. Run from sin and temptation and run to Jesus. He will give us what we need as we seek him and his kingdom. In our greatest need, out of every need that we could ever possibly put on the table, our greatest need is the fact that we in our sinful state need to be reconciled to Christ. To Christ, this man who experienced the hardest emotions ever and had the greatest reason to live a life of anxiety. Have you thought about that? Jesus was born knowing what the end was going to be. He had 30 some odd years on this earth knowing what was coming knowing where he was going to end up. You think he would have had good reason to feel anxious or worry about what, not he thought might happen, what he knew would happen, but he wasn't. Because he was Jesus, because he knew why he should not worry, he knew what the cross was going to bring, but he also knew that that tomb was going to be empty three days later. He knew how it was going to end. He trusted the Father. And his trust in the one who is in control affected how he lived out those times where it would have been perfectly logical to be anxious to some degree. Our son is four months and some change. And I was reminded while studying through this and, and, and writing this of, of some of the anxious moments that accompany a, a pregnancy and a delivery. And our delivery had some level of anxiety to it. Laurel's blood pressure was high. The, the heart rate of Zion was kind of low. There, there, was, there was all kinds of things going and we tried and, and I tried to, to wait it out and, and, and do what we needed to do. Long story short, we, we ended up needing to have an emergency C-section. To kind of set the stage, the, the 
my parents and, and Gary and Stephanie were out in the lobby and they were, they were waiting. We were like, man, we're looking at like maybe six, seven, eight hours. We had already been there for a while. My dad had just brought me Whataburger. I was happy. I went in, had a bite of the Whataburger. The doctor comes in, looks at all the readings and was like, very calmly, yeah, I think we're gonna need to do that C-section. I was like, oh, had one bite of this burger. I was hungry. When, when, when are we gonna do that? About four or five minutes. Nurses start rushing into the room, handing me clothes, doing all this kind of stuff. I had just walked out of the lobby saying, it's probably gonna be like six or seven hours and then had to walk back out and say, change of plans. We're looking at about 10 minutes. So I run back in. I start putting on all the, the garb and thing. I gotta wear this beard deal. It's, it's a whole, there's all kinds of stuff happening. I'm stressed, Laurel stressed, everybody's stressed, except for the doctor. This is just another day in the office for him. And he is like a scary level of calm. And as they kind of rush us back to the operating room, I'm nervous. I'm just kind of like, just, I'm just doing what I'm told to do. Go here, stand here, sit here, stay away, all those kind of things. And I could start to feel a certain level of anxiousness kind of pop up in me. And the, the, the thing that settled me out of everything that possibly could have happened, the doctor, we, we were like moments away from this surgery happening. The doctor makes the incision mark with that marker thing and then takes the pin and tosses it to me on the other side of the thing and says, hey, here's your souvenir. <laughs> Puts on his glasses like a rock star. And Zion comes out perfectly fine. Why in that moment where I should have been panic attack level of anxious, that moment, I could not have been more calm. Why? I trusted with everything in me that doctor had things under control. Everything was gonna be fine. Why? I looked at his face and I knew everything was gonna be fine. Friend, the level of peace that you're going to have when the hard things come in your life are directly related to how much you trust the one that says he's got everything in control. If you can sing the song that we've been singing since we were kids with a heartfelt earnesty, if he's got the whole world in his hands with no level of, mm, you're gonna be, you're gonna be fine. How do you develop that? You pursue him. If your only relationship with the creator and maker of all things is kind of a occasional church trip or every once in a while you open your Bible or it's, it's just kind of a thing that's kind of sort of partially culturally part of who you are, then whenever the difficulty comes and you hear the promises of, of your friends that come into your life and say, don't worry, God's got this, you're gonna hear that and be like, what are you talking about? Because the relationship's not there. But friend, it is different when you are passionately walking with Jesus and something hits your life that you're not ready for. And that friend or pastor or brother or sister comes to you and says, hey, God's got this. That is a different level of peace. And it is available for us if we trust. And the cross and the resurrection is the ultimate expression of that. We can trust Jesus no matter what comes because you are perfectly safe in the arms of him who created life itself, who holds the universe by the strength of his hand, who sustains all life with the power of his will. We can go on and on and on about all of the truth claims. This is why Paul said that the future glory that is awaiting him is not even worth comparing to the pain and suffering of this life. The truth of the gospel can meet every emotional need that we have when rightly believed. It doesn't make all the pain go away, but it puts it in perspective and it gives it all a purpose. It's all doing something even whenever we can't see it, especially whenever you can't see it. Everything you go through as a Jesus follower, by God's grace, is being used to make you more like Christ. So don't worry, friend. Jesus has you so much more than that doctor had us in that delivery room. And he will give you what you need. Let tomorrow worry for itself. There's enough trouble there. You trust 
in Christ. Father, this morning, we thank you for who you are, for what you've done, for what you continue to do. We thank you that you are worthy of all of our trust, of all of our hope, that you supply us with peace, and that no matter what circumstances might arise in our life, we can walk through them or trusting in the rock of ages, no matter the storms that could threaten to wash us over. Friend, you might be here this morning and you're a believer and the encouragement to you is to continue to believe the truth that you know, but trust it deeply and truly. Don't worry, it doesn't do you any good. Christ has you. Seek his kingdom. Be about the things you know you're supposed to be about. But you might be here this morning and you're not sure about all of this Jesus stuff or you've got questions or you've never considered the reality and the ramification of the penalty of your sin, of the good things that you know that you're supposed to do but you don't and the bad things that you know that you're not supposed to do but you do. And this morning, what you need to trust is the finished work of Christ. That he came, he lived, he died, and he rose for you, that you might be forgiven and reconciled to him and that you can be promised and given life everlasting if you would but just humble yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross, leave your sin, follow him. We all need to trust this morning, the only question is what kind of trust? The continuing trust or the first time trust? Pastor will be down at the front at the end. I'll be down at the front of the end. There are cards at the pew or seat back in front of you. You can fill out and drop in the black box. Ask a pastor or minister to call you. We'd love to talk to you, but we'd especially love to talk to you today about what it means to rightly trust Christ. Lord, we love you. Bless us and keep us in your most holy and precious name we pray.